Hi everyone, I'm Sir Julay, and for this slide sets, we will be discussing the chain of infection. The chain of infection outlines certain conditions that must be met in order for an infectious disease to be spread from person to person. Understanding the chain of infection will allow us to understand how to break the chain of infection, that is, to prevent the spread of an infectious disease. Pause this video, memorize the sequence as seen in this slide, and when you are ready, let us enumerate the six links in the sequence. The first is the etiologic agent or the organism, followed by the place where the organism naturally resides or the reservoir, then the portal of exit from the reservoir. This is followed by the mode of transmission, a portal of entry into a host, and to complete the chain of infection, the susceptible host. Let us discuss the links one by one. First up is the etiologic agent. The etiologic agent in the chain of infection are the microorganisms capable of producing disease. In other words, the pathogens. Microorganisms include bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and helminths. There are several factors that influence these pathogens. These are virulence, pathogenicity, infectivity, mode of action, dose, toxigenicity, and immunogenicity. Virulence is the capacity to cause severe disease. Virulence is a relative term for there is no absolute measure of virulence, and virulence is always measured relative to another microorganism. For example, measles virus is of low virulence, while the rabies virus is highly virulent. In some cases, the fatality rate is used to express virulence. As you can see in this graph, MERS and SARS are more virulent than the common cold or the measles. The ability to produce disease is termed as pathogenicity. Another factor when considering etiologic agent is the mode of action. It answers the question, how does the microorganism damage the tissue? Among others, mode of action may include direct damage by microorganisms, damage by microbial toxins, or indirect damage via inflammation or indirect damage via the immune response. The dose is the amount of microorganism needed to cause an infection. In this table, you could see that 1 to 10 mycobacterium tuberculosis cells is sufficient to cause TB. You can observe in this slide the huge difference in the infective dose of Salmonella and Shigella. Since Shigella is resistant to gastric acids, a very small amount of inoculum is required to cause an infection. For Salmonella, a large inoculum is required because the organism is inactivated by gastric acids. The ability to produce soluble toxins or endotoxins is referred to as toxigenicity, while the ability to induce an immune response is referred to as immunogenicity. This slide summarizes the factors we discussed previously. Let us apply the chain of infection to one of the most common diseases found in the Philippines, tuberculosis. So what is the etiologic agent of TB? If you answered mycobacterium tuberculosis, you are correct. Let us proceed to the next link in the chain of infection, and that is the reservoir. The reservoir of an infectious agent is the habitat in which the agent normally lives, grows, and multiplies. Reservoir include any person, animal, arthropod, plant, soil, or substances, or combination of these. The reservoir may or may not be the source from which an infectious agent is transferred to a host. For example, the reservoir of Clostridium botulinum is soil, but the source of most botulinum infection is improperly canned food containing the C. botulinum spores. Humans are the most common source of infection for others and for themselves. Human reservoir may or may not show the effects of illness. Couriers are individuals with inapparent infection who are capable of transmitting the pathogen to others. Basing from the word asymptomatic, these couriers never experience symptoms despite being infected. Chronic couriers, on the other hand, continue to harbor a pathogen for months or even years after their initial infection. One notorious chronic courier is Mary Malon or Typhoid Mary, who was an asymptomatic chronic courier of Salmonella Typhi. As a cook in New York City and New Jersey in the early 1900s, 
She unintentionally infected dozens of people until she was placed in isolation on an island in the East River where she died 23 years later. A key point of the previous slide is to know that Salmonella typhi may produce a patient that would eventually become a chronic courier. Incubatory couriers can transmit the agent during the incubation period before clinical illness begins. Incubatory couriers exist when the incubation period overlaps with the infectious period as can occur in some cases of chicken pox. Convalescent couriers have recovered from their illness but remain capable of transmitting to others. Convalescent couriers occur when the period of infectiousness extends beyond the period of clinical illness. Couriers of this type can be a significant issue in promoting the spread of certain enteric infections such as those caused by the bacterium V. cholera. And so to summarize the classic examples of couriers, typhoid fever, chronic couriers, chickenpox, incubatory couriers, and cholera, convalescent couriers. A disease that has jumped from a non-human animal to humans is called zoonosis. This table shows the common examples of zoonosis. Animal reservoir of the disease leptospirosis caused by the microorganism leptospira interrogans include rats, dogs, pigs, and even raccoons. Rabies caused by a rhabdovirus has dogs, bats, raccoons, skunks, and fox as their reservoir. Toxoplasma gondii, the causative agent of toxoplasmosis, has cats as the animal courier. This table shows the common arthropod-borne diseases. Mosquitoes are the vector for filariasis, malaria, and dengue caused by helminth, protozoa, and virus respectively. Fleas are the vector for bubonic plague caused by a bacteria. The vector for the bacteria that cause Lyme disease are ticks. And lastly, an aquatic snail is the vector for the helminth that causes your schistosomiasis. Going back to TB, we already determined that the etiologic agent is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, what is the reservoir? For reservoir, we have the respiratory tract of humans. Let us discuss portal of exit next. The portal of exit is the route by which the etiologic agent leaves the reservoir. It may be through the blood and body fluids, skin, mucous membrane, respiratory tract, genitourinary tract, or the gastrointestinal tract. This table shows some of the most common portals of exit. The portal of exit for mycobacterium tuberculosis which resides in the respiratory tract is through the nose or mouth through sneezing, coughing, breathing, or talking. Microorganisms residing in the GI tract such as the Salmonella species and Hepatitis A would also have GI tract as the portal of exit via the feces or saliva. The portal of exit for HIV includes open wounds, needle puncture site, or any disruption of intact skin or mucous membrane surfaces. Staphylococcus aureus in wounds exits via the drainage from a cut or wound. Again, let us apply the portal of exit to TB. The causative agent, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which resides in the respiratory tract of humans, also exits via the respiratory route through coughing, sneezing, or even talking. For the fourth link, we have the mode of transmission. The mode of transmission is the means of transmission to reach another person or host through a receptive portal of entry. There are different classifications for modes of transmission. Here is one of the classification. Airborne transmission, droplet transmission, contact transmission, vector-borne transmission, or vehicle transmission. I remember this as AVCD for airborne, vector, vehicle, contact, and droplet. Airborne transmission involves droplet nuclei, 5 micrometers or smaller, or dust particles that contain pathogen and remain suspended in air for extended period and may be blown over great distances. The key number there is 5 micrometer or is smaller. Examples include pulmonary tuberculosis, measles, chickenpox or varicella, and disseminated herpes zoster. 
I usually remember this as the diseases that are blown over great distances. Missile sounds like missile, which covers a great distance. For varicella or chicken pox, just imagine a flying chicken covering a great distance. For disseminated varicella zoster, our cue is that disseminated means spread throughout. And for PTB, imagine the aerosol blown over great distances. Droplet transmission refers to large, short-range aerosols from infected individuals that are propelled by coughing, sneezing, talking, or suctioning respiratory secretions. It is a form of direct transmission but can occur only if the source and the host are within 1 meter or 3 feet of each other. So how large is large? More than 5 micrometer. And how short-range is short-range? About 1 meter or 3 feet. Examples include diphtheria, epiglottitis, influenza, meningitis, mumps, pneumonia, pertussis, rubella, and pharyngitis. To remember some, we could use the mnemonic droplet that is DRP4LET 1D, 1R, 4 ps diphtheria, rubella, pertussis, parotitis or mumps, pneumonia, and pharyngitis. Sometimes, we get confused with rubella. Is it measles or German measles? Which is which? This meme beautifully captures the confusion. When you get confused, just pause and remember the MMR vaccine, which stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. By logic, rubella could not be measles because that will make the MMR vaccine as measles, mumps, measles. So, rubella is German measles. Contact transmission is the most important and most frequent mode of transmission. It involves immediate and direct transfer of microorganisms from person to person through touching, biting, kissing, or sexual intercourse. Contact transmission may be direct or indirect. Clostridium difficile, RSV, wound infections, skin infections such as cutaneous diphtheria, Herpes simplex, pediculosis, scabies, varicella zoster, and conjunctivitis are all transmitted via the contact transmission route. Highlighted in this slide is varicella zoster, which you might remember as already being presented under airborne transmission. This indicates that certain entities may have one, two, or even three modes of transmission. When in doubt, you could actually visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website to determine the type and duration of precautions recommended for selected infections and conditions. A vehicle is a substance that serves as an intermediate means to transport and introduce an infectious agent into a susceptible host through a suitable portal of entry. Vehicles include contaminated food, water, surgical instruments, or dressings, or fomites. Fomites are inanimate materials or objects such as handkerchief, toys, soiled clothes, cooking, or eating utensils. To summarize vehicle transmission, the etiologic agent needs a vehicle to transfer from the source to the susceptible host. For example, food or water may become contaminated by a food handler who carries the hepatitis A virus. The food is then ingested by a susceptible host. A vector is an animal or flying or crawling insect that serves as an intermediate means of transporting the infectious agent. Transmission may occur either by injecting salivary fluid during biting or by depositing feces or other materials on the skin through the bite wound or a traumatized skin area. A classic vector-borne disease is dengue. The modes of transmission we recently discussed are referred to as horizontal transmission. There is also what we call a vertical transmission, wherein the mother transfers the infectious agent to the baby. A classic example of diseases that are transmitted vertically are the torch infections. P for toxoplasmosis, O for others, R for rubella, C for cytomegalovirus, and H for herpes simplex virus. So let us go back to TB. What is the mode of transmission? 
the mycobacterium tuberculosis is transmitted by airborne transmission. Now, let us proceed with the portal of entry. The portal of entry is the manner in which a pathogen enters a susceptible host. Often, the microorganism enters the body of the host by the same route they used to leave the source. The portals of entry are the same as portals of exit except the skin. Why? This is because an intact skin prevents infection. Take note though that any break in the skin can readily serve as a portal of entry. Going back to TB, what is the portal of entry? Often, the portal of exit is the same as the portal of entry. This is applicable for mycobacterium tuberculosis, whose portal of entry is also the respiratory route. And for the last link to complete the chain of infection, the susceptible host. A susceptible host is any person who is at risk for infection. On the other hand, a compromised host is a host or a person that is at an increased risk for infection. Examples of compromised hosts include the elderly and the newborn, clients receiving immune suppression treatment, those with immune deficiency conditions, patients with burns, and patients with chronic illness. So to complete the chain of infection of tuberculosis, who is the susceptible host? Any person could actually be a susceptible host. Let us apply what we have learned in this example. Nurse J is admitting patient A at the pediatric ward due to measles. The nurse noted that patient A contracted measles after spending some time playing and talking to patient B, who was patient's A sibling and is already on the fourth hospital day at the ward. Trace the chain of infection. Pause this video and in a piece of paper, write the etiologic agent, the reservoir, portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, and susceptible host. If you are done, let us reveal the answers. The etiologic agent or the microorganism is the rubiola. Patient B was the reservoir. The portal of exit is through the respiratory tract. And we said missile sounds like missile, and therefore it is airborne transmission. The portal of entry is also the respiratory tract. And patient A was the susceptible host. Pause this video, gather your thoughts, and when you are ready, let us have a practice test. The capacity to cause severe disease is A, virulence, B, immunogenicity, C, dose, D, toxigenicity. You have five seconds. And the correct answer for this one is A, virulence. In dengue transmission, the mosquito is referred to as A, vector, B, susceptible host, C, vehicle, D, causative agent. You have five seconds. If you answered vector, you are correct. PTB is transmitted to A, airborne, B, contact, C, droplet, D, vehicle. You have 5 seconds. And the correct answer is A, airborne. And lastly, the most common mode of transmission is A, airborne, B, contact, C, droplet, D, vehicle. You have 5 seconds. And the correct answer is B, contact. If you got 4 out of 4, good job. If not, you may review the video again. So this ends the presentation. Please do not uh, forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Memory Aid Dash Nursing. Thank you.